while you guys are here, right, we'll give some shout outs. We have um, anyone in a DEF CON group, DCG, from local area code? Well, okay, well, this one is gonna happen then. Please go and check out DCG room. These are all DEF CON groups. DEF CON is year round. We have to plan year round also, but like we can do great things, right? DCG, 305, go Miami. Um, <laughs> So yeah, like, you know, go there after, get inspired. Um, if you guys are new, the room over here is the LHC room. They were out partying a little bit last night, so there's nobody in there right now, but you know, <laughs> things happen in Vegas. Um, also, we do have a bar over there, um, you know, so if anyone is needing a, a refreshment or whatnot, we have that. Um, if anyone needs the bathrooms, they're gonna be right over there, just kind of as a heads up. Um, and then also, um, as we're getting older, right, some of, we've lost a, a few great hackers this year. Um, there is a memorial room, right, so if, you know, you want a place that's quiet to reflect and whatnot, um, that's also there, and it, it's just a really fabulous spot for just healing, and it's also a good spot, just quiet and that. Um, after our, oh, <laughs> after our, uh, discussion in our, our talk, right? There'll be a question and answer period. We're gonna go over there in one of the rooms so that way it's a, a more intimate environment and if you have any questions and answers um, for any of the folks up here. So we'll let you guys know which room um, is gonna be that. Um, and so yeah, in the next uh, minute or so, we'll, we'll get started. So thank you guys all for coming and um, waking up early. I know that might've been a challenge for some of you and for those who haven't gotten to sleep, this is gonna be a great talk and then you, know, then you guys can get some shut eye. So, thank you very much, and well, wait, let's start on time. Yeah, let's get started. Hey guys, how's it going? All right, come on, let's wake up. Come on, cheer up, come on. You made it for the minute, got that guy. So this is our 31st year of DEF CON. Um, thank you for coming. It all works out because of you guys showing up and spreading the word, and make sure that everyone's like, gets excited about learning about what DEF CON is, not just a pack of hackers and doing crazy stuff, but it's more about the community. And, uh, and the most important thing is talking about um, how much work it takes to make everything look kind of simple and working. Um, and you know, thanks to these guys, it's something that uh, we all should like, you know, remember. Um, so this is our first talk today uh, for, this is track five. Uh, it's called A Different Uber Postmortem by Joe Sullivan. Um, and uh, enjoy it. Welcome, Joe. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name's Joe Sullivan. I'm currently the CEO of a nonprofit, um, but for most of my career, I've worked in cybersecurity, like a lot of you. Um, and I'm going to walk you through an experience I've been going through probably since when I started thinking about it, the beginning of my career, that's still going on. Um, when I um, had the chance to be the CSO of some really big companies, one of the things that I came to appreciate is that you can't do security on your own. It has to be a, I think of it as really a, a three-legged stool. Like, there's the commitment that you make inside your organization, but you have to partner with the government also. And then the third thing that a lot of people don't understand is the importance of part partnering with researchers. Um, so. I've had a, a lot of opportunities to talk with security leaders about my case. They often reach out to me when they're getting nervous because they have a bunch of lawyers showing up to their meetings or they're getting together in kind of closed rooms. And so I've had a lot of chances to talk with security leaders about what my case might mean for them and how they could set up their organization, their company, and their relationships with government to be better so that what happened to me doesn't happen to them. But as I was thinking about it, there was one story and perspective that I don't think got enough attention, and so that's why I asked to do this talk. And that's the perspective of the security research community. And so I'm gonna kind of look at this case, not from my perspective, but from maybe the perspective of an outside researcher. And thinking about it, not just in terms of this case, but what it means for the future. Because legal cases are always about precedent. Um, one note as I'm getting started, um, I'm appealing my case. So the case is still going on, which limits what I can say in some contexts. Also, I was an employee of Uber during the whole time that the incident transpired, and so I had an employment contract and a 
NDA and all that, so I'm limited to what I can talk about from that perspective as well. Um, so when I talk about the case, I'm only going to reference what's in the public record. And if you hear me talk about something, it's from the perspective of what I saw sitting in the courtroom, not from what I saw inside the company. So uh, I've been working in computer security since 1997. I was actually a federal prosecutor here in Las Vegas. And I was asked to become a cybercrime focused prosecutor while living here. And of course, that was in the first few years where DEF CON was starting to pick up. And that might have been one of my first DEF CON experiences. And I might not have been spotted as a Fed. Um, but I got to know a lot about the security community by coming here and thinking about the different perspectives. And that's when I started thinking about um, the research perspective on working with us. And so I'm going to touch on a lot of that as I go through this. But each of these stops kind of taught me a lesson that led to some of the things that happened in this case. But the case for me really got started, uh, it was in November of 2017. I got an email on my personal email from a reporter asking me to go on the record about me being fired from Uber. And I think I hadn't even been fired when the reporter reached out to me. It's kind of like, it was a really strange situation where I was learning as much from Bloomberg as I was learning from my company or X company, depending on whatever moment that day it was. And I was up in the mountains. In, it was Thanksgiving week. I was on vacation with my family. I was actually in a grocery store. We were getting food for Thanksgiving. And I got kind of these messages. And I was like, this, this must be a big misunderstanding. I went out uh, hiking that afternoon with my family. And I didn't know. It, almost immediately, articles started coming out talking about how uh, I'd been part of a cover-up and that I was fired for covering stuff up, and that I had paid money to people to delete data. And I didn't really know because um, after I was terminated, they also bricked my phone and my laptop remotely. Um, so I, I was kind of up in the mountains with no tech. But like Twitter and everything else was blowing up that day, and the narrative was set, I think. Jump forward three years later, uh, I was uh, working as the CSO at Cloudflare at the time. And um, I think my family and I found out through the news that I had been charged. We actually found out because a friend of one of my daughters heard it on NPR and told, my, I think, and told her. And so it was the second time I got surprised. Um, Third time is going to be on me, I guess. Um, but it actually wasn't accurate. I wasn't arrested. They put out a press release saying I was arrested, but I was actually at home. And um, so they corrected that eventually. Um, but I did get charged. And I was charged with two counts. Uh, the first count was um, basically obstructing an FTC investigation is the way they characterize it. And the second count was something called misprison of a felony. The first count really had to do with um, what our company said to the FTC and didn't say to the FTC about our security posture and whether we were transparent with them. Uh, that's a talk for a different day. What I want to focus on is the second count, misprison of a felony. Misprison is this really old common law type thing, and I'm not a legal expert on this stuff, although I should be at this point. Um, but misprison is basically if you help someone else get away with a felony in, in, in something like that. And so the first part of it, of misprison, has to be that there is a different felony. And in this case, that different felony was the actions of the researchers. And so for me to be convicted, the jury had to believe that the researchers had committed a crime first. So jump forward, we actually um, went to trial last September. This is a, no cameras in the courtroom, so this is a picture one of my daughters drew. That's me in my uh, mask on the left, the judge, a witness, and the jury on the right. 
Um, but like, I, I want to narrow down the focus, so I do want to talk about number one, that misprison count. Um, but one of the things I really appreciated when I got sentenced in May, just a couple months ago, was the judge went out of his way to say at the sentencing hearing to the government, this was a very unusual case. There's never been a case like this before. He asked the prosecutor, could you think of a case like this that's ever been brought before? And the prosecutor said, not on all fours. The judge said, not on all threes. So they were going at it. And the judge said, this is not a white collar case. There was no financial motivation. Um, it's not like anything I've ever seen before. And then he also talked about the investigation that my team did. The thing that I was most happy about from the trial was the way my team got portrayed and how the judge perceived them. What the judge said was, we're not, the data not actually never got exposed in the wild. So a lot of times I'll see these lists of biggest data breaches in history and up in the middle of it will be this case. But those records were actually all recovered and never kind of like out on the dark web, if you will. So, because my team did a really good job on the investigation. And the judge recognized that. And the prosecutor even agreed. Well, the prosecutor, I think, said we got lucky. So, kind of stepping back again, I've been thinking a lot about what I said at the beginning about how security needs to be a partnership to get it right inside a company. And as I think about my case, these are some of the questions that I worry about. How do we tilt against the bias of perceiving every request by an outside person as, as extortion? And if you, talk to the, like, if you talk to the people at the bug bounty companies, this is an issue that comes up on a daily basis, especially with new programs, and especially, especially with new researchers. And we also want to create an ecosystem where companies feel comfortable engaging with those researchers. And one of my biggest disappointments from the case is I think I set that backwards because of the way this case was perceived, because of the way the researchers slash hackers were perceived and all that. I've heard lots of stories, especially in the first year afterwards, of companies like hitting pause on their bounty programs, rolling them back, their lawyers getting very anxious about them. And then you layer on top of it kind of the blow up of ransomware, which is, you know, another level in terms of intrusion and extortion. Um, and then another question is, how do we make sure that researchers can trust a company? Like how many people know what a responsible disclosure policy is? Hopefully a lot of you will talk about that. Um, but companies put up these responsible disclosure policies that says we won't refer to you law, we won't refer you to law enforcement if you give us all the information and cooperate and make sure that nobody gets hurt. That's paraphrasing. I have some examples we'll go through. And how do we make sure that the law protects this engagement and make sure that companies can utilize the researchers and the government will respect it and then we'll have that really strong stool to, for all the consumers who use our products to stand on. So this is where I want to go way back in time. So I mentioned I was a federal prosecutor. Um, I don't know, does anybody remember Napster? <laughs> well, Napster was a really interesting case from the perspective of me as the, um, by the time every, uh, the recording industry and everybody was really upset with Napster, I was, I had left Vegas and I was living in um, the Bay Area and I was uh, working full time doing tech cases and I think I was the first federal prosecutor in the country just like in an office full time cranking on federal cybercrime cases. I actually had a folder in my office that said Napster because we had been getting pushed to prosecute Napster. And I always remember I had this conversation with my top boss, Robert Mueller, who uh, went on from that job. His next one was head of the FBI. And he said, right now it feels like a bunch of companies fighting with each other. Let's th let them fight it out first. And like, let's we need to figure out the dynamic of our relationship with companies and how much we should be doing what they ask us to do. Because cyber is very different from a lot of other areas of law enforcement in that so much of what happens happens in third party private sector hands. So much of the internet, especially in this country, sits in the servers of a bunch of companies. And so 
from the government perspective, it's really hard to figure out what the right dynamic is around relationships. We need cooperation. If you're on the government side, you need cooperation because you need access and visibility to protect people. But if you're on the company side, you're, you're, you're dealing with like also privacy commitments and it's a, it's a lot going on there. But then there's also the economic motivation of the company and wanting to push certain cases and not push certain other cases. And so as, as the government, you kind of have to think through all that. So we decided not to. And there were civil suits and it actually resolved things for Napster. And I remember thinking that was good. But then, um, I think it was DEF CON 9, um, there was a um, case, um, so there was a speaker. This is the whole agenda of DEF CON 9, by the way. <laughs> That's every speaker for the whole event. Um, and you can't obviously see it, obviously you can't see it from where you are and I can't either, but I'm pretty sure the bottom left uh, was a guy named Dmitry Skylarov speaking about, um, he was an employee of a Russian company called Elcomsoft and they had put out some software that would um, break um, the encryption on the o Adobe eBook reader. So it was kind of like Napster 2.0 unfolding and Adobe was really pushing hard with my office to prosecute uh, a case. And so they, they Dmitry Skarilov came in, from Russia, he spoke at DEF CON, and if you could look really close, I, t I took a screenshot from uh, Wikipedia of uh, notice noticeable incidents at DEF CON. The second one was when Dmitry came off the stage from talking about the Adobe eBook Reader encryption breaking tool, he was arrested by the FBI. Uh, and he was taken into custody. And it was a mess. And a lot of people protested. This is um, the picture on the right is people from uh, the security community protesting against the prosecution of Dimitri. Uh, and uh, that was at the San Francisco Federal Building. Um, So let me back up, sorry. So how did, the, how did the Dimitri story end? I think everybody realized pretty quickly that Dimitri um, was, he wasn't intending to, to do anything particularly, I guess. His company might have been trying to monetize the situation, but the charges were dropped against Dimitri and um, they went forward against the company. I was involved in the case early on um, and then I, le I left the U.S. Attorney's Office and I went to go work at eBay, so I didn't actually, I was there during the time when the charges against Dimitri were dropped. I was part of the prosecution team. And then after I left, the case went forward against the company. And I think the government lost. So to me, that was another chance for me to think about the research versus company versus government triangle. And I was on the side of the government and we were arresting a researcher. And at the time, I thought that was the right thing to do. But then I went into the private sector, and I remember almost like a month after I got to eBay, we got this email, and it, said, it was from somebody, and it said, we, ha we found a security vulnerability. I will tell you if you pay me. And I remember I personally had this like angry reaction to this person. like. Why do they want to get paid? We, I'm, trying, I'm fighting inside this company to get them to do the right thing and protect our users and we need to do everything we can because that's my job. And then there's someone on the outside who could help me and they wouldn't give it to me. And that was like my next perspective from a company on security researchers. But then I, like, I really got to start learning more about that, that different perspective. This was an article written by Bruce Schneier and, um, 2001, just a couple of months after Dimitri's uh, case, while well, it was still pending. And th there was this big fight between Microsoft and the research community um, because Microsoft had gotten mad because researchers were publishing vulnerabilities. And I started really thinking about it from different perspectives. Um, move forward a few years, I got to PayPal. I switched from the eBay side to the PayPal side. And I, I helped Andy Steingrubel, who's now the CISO of um, Pinterest, with the publication of what we did at PayPal in 2007. And it got praised, I think, by a lot of people in the research community because we published one of the first responsible disclosure policies. Um, this was an article by Jeremiah Grossman praising it. 
And so this was the language that we published at, at PayPal in 2007, because we'd gone from that experience where we were angry at researchers for wanting money to, to completely flipping. And we said, if you follow our guidelines, we won't refer you to the government and we won't um, bring an action against you. And almost immediately after that, companies started publishing those more, and then researchers started pushing even harder and saying, you shouldn't, not you shouldn't just not prosecute us, you should actually pay us. And there was the no more free bugs campaign that Dino and a bunch of people did. So a couple of years later, I had moved over to Facebook. I was the CSO at Facebook, and I worked with uh, Alex Rice, who's now the CTO of HackerOne, and we published some, our own version of what I had helped write at PayPal. So we published the Facebook version in December 2010, and we said basically the same thing. We won't bring lawsuit or ask law enforcement to investigate you if you contact us. We actually came to, uh, here at DEF CON, we launched our bug bounty program at, at Facebook in 2011, and that was a heavy lift for us back then because we weren't the mega corporation that it is now. Um, but we announced and launched the program here. It got a lot of good publicity and we paid out for a lot of bugs. But the relationship with security researchers from inside the perspective of the company wasn't actually that amazing when we first rolled out the bounty program. This was an interesting story about a month after, I think. So we now said, we're open for business, we'll pay you for b vulnerabilities. This um, young man in uh, the Palestinian uh, territories at the time uh, found a vulnerability on Facebook where he could pay post on somebody else's wall. And he tried to report it to my team, but he couldn't figure out how to do it. And there was like this whole glitch in communication because we weren't good at communicating and he wasn't good at communicating and we were all trying to figure this thing out. So he got irritated and he went on Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook page and he, using a uh, picture of Snowden, posted on Mark's page. <laughs> so uh, first, sorry for, it's his first line, first, sorry for violating your privacy. Um, and so I had this dilemma of, we had language in our responsible disclosure and bug bounty program saying we won't go after researchers and we will pay you. And so we actually talked about this inside the company and we're like, is this an unauthorized access? Is it illegal what he did? We decided we're not going to refer this to anybody. I mean, it was CNN sent a reporter to interview him in person. Uh, and so uh, the case got a lot of attention and I got a lot of blowback because I said, well, we can't pay you for your research. The security community actually came together and created a fund and a bunch of people from the research community contributed the fund and so he ended up getting a lot more money than he would have if um, we had just paid him the bounty. But you know, there are a lot of like these, and I could give you probably a thousand examples like this. This is just one that I can talk about because it was so public. Uh, another one that was kind of public was um, there was this um, researcher, Reginaldo, from Brazil, and he found an RCE uh, in Facebook. And not too long before that, one of the leaders on my team had been quoted as saying, our bug bounty program is so awesome, it's doing great. Um, and someone asked, what's the max bounty you'll pay? And he said, uh, we would pay a million dollars for the right bounty if you found something that was that significant and harmful. And this researcher, he thought about it and he's like, I've got RCE on Facebook, which is basically, for those who don't know, it's just like straight access. So he had found something big, but he reported it to us and we worked with him. We, we did pay him, I think, our largest bounty at the time, which I think it was 33,500. Um, but we also hired him and he moved from Brazil to work in, uh, on my team. Uh, and kind of be on the other side of the bug bounty program. And that went really great. I think he stayed at Facebook for six years. Um, I left Facebook in March of 2015, after seven years there building out the team, and I went to Uber. And um, 
Within, I think, a month of me getting to Uber, we published a responsible disclosure policy saying the same things. Uh, and I worked with a, a couple of members of our team to put that out. And we said we won't take legal or administrative action against people who report vulnerabilities and so on, just kind of like similar to what we'd said before. And one of the cool things was, that I appreciated at that time was further down on that page, there is a name Rob Fletcher. We were acknowledging Rob, and Rob was actually the, one of the people who was helping push out this policy with me. He had been an outside researcher who'd contacted Uber before I got there, reporting a vulnerability, and the team had hired him even before I got there. And Rob ended up ultimately running the product security team at Uber and is a very successful security engineer. Um, we, um, right after that, I, I mentioned publicly, uh, I think this one was on Quora, that we had a private Hacker One bug bounty program. So we launched, so this is li literally within a very short t period of time after I got to Uber. And then, you know, you a lot of companies launch a private program now and they never take it public. And there's a big debate whether you keep your bug bounty program private or public. We decided we wanted to take it public, but you, we had to sit in private for a while to fix all the things that researchers reported to us. Because I'll tell you, when you launch a bounty program, you really do find things that you wouldn't find otherwise. I, from a company standpoint, bug bounty programs are amazing. I, as a security leader, I'd have this huge budget and I would pay pen testing companies a set amount of money up front and then they would find three vulnerabilities every time. And so it was like, no matter how much I paid them, I was gonna get the same kind of report that I would have to like, look really hard to find a little bit of important stuff. With researchers, you don't have to pay them a dime until they find something important. And so, like, from a company's standpoint, I really believe that we, like, and I used to say this, I would say it's negligence to not have a bug bounty program. Like, you have to have that opportunity for people to do the, the work. So we launched our public program, and within a very short time after that, this came to my personal email and my Uber email, Hey Joe, I found a major vulnerability in Uber. I was able to dump Uber database and many other things. I did what I always do. I've gotten versions of this email hundreds of times. I forwarded it to um, our bug bounty triage team. And Rob Fletcher, the same researcher who had gotten the job at the company, um, oh, I just put this slide in to remind me that everything I'm gonna talk about now is stuff that uh, was covered publicly in the trial. So like I was saying at the beginning, <laughs> I'm only going to talk about the case from what's public. So Rob sent an email back really quickly after I'd gotten that email, forwarded it to them, and Rob said, hey, my name's Rob, I work in product security here at Uber. I understand you have a vulnerability you want to disclose. Our preferred method is use our public bounty program at HackerOne, but if you'd like to use email to exchange details, let's go. Um, and so that's kind of the start of the case. During the trial, there was a whole bunch of debate and testimony and argument about the interaction with these researchers slash hackers. And I never know what to call them because back at the time, we, think of, we thought of them as researchers. Um, and you know, now everybody thinks of them as felons. Um, so there was this whole question of whether they were, this was a slide from the trial getting a bunch of quotes from people who uh, testified. And it was a bunch of people from my team saying, mostly what happened in this case, in terms of our interaction, it was quite typical. Um, we had a lot of debate uh, internally often about, you know, back then, so you, know, you have to remember 2016 is a long time ago now in internet time, and especially in bug bounty program time. We had very generic rules back then. Companies now have very long rules of what you can and can't um, poke at. And so, like uh, Colin Green said during his testimony, there's no Supreme Court of bug bounty rules. We just look at each case and try and figure it out back then. And Rob said our guidelines were flexible. And another member of the team, Matt, said in his testimony, look, if, we, if in these situations we actually went and referred s someone to law enforcement, can you imagine? how the research community would react and then our program would tank. So um, 
We, um, act and actually the, the new CEO of Uber, when he testified, he said it was the right thing to do to pay them. We, uh, during the investigation, I don't want to spend too much time on the investigation because I don't have uh, that much time and, and this is focused more on the researcher side. We documented everything on the team. We had a large number of people involved. This is, uh, I think, 25 members of my team worked on the investigation. We pulled in the communications team. They communicated all the way up to their exec level. Uh, we pulled in uh, legal. Uh, they communicated with their manager who ran the privacy team for legal. So they were all kind of in the loop working through what we did on the case. We had a data breach response policy. We had a data breach response plan. We have a breach incident response playbook. We had all the documentation you would hope to have. We had specifically the names of who in legal we were supposed to escalate things to. We did those things. Legal was responsible for deciding what gets disclosed according to policy to whom. And legal, the lawyer testified, said, um, they gave the advice to my team, it's not a reportable data breach situation if three things. One, they're, you're confident the hackers no longer have the data. Two, confident the data was not disseminated further. And three, you can get the hackers to sign an NDA. So that was the advice from legal at the time. And then I want to jump back to my sentencing hearing, because this was, again, the only time I, like the judge really gave his opinions on the case was at the sentencing. And so a big focus during the case from, if you go back to those articles I showed you that came out in 2017, they all said, we gave them an NDA to shut them up. And the judge said, um, the NDA argument the government makes doesn't fly. This wasn't a cover up. It was part of the ability to solve the problem, in my view, and the way that the evidence came in. I was so happy, like I said earlier, when the judge said that because it validated how hard my team worked and what they did on the investigation. Um, because we, on my teams, we always had a culture of attribution in our investigations. We always wanted to know who we were dealing with on the other side. I, I would love to someday give a talk just on the concept of attribution because like, security leaders very much disagree on philosophically whether people inside the company should care who they're, to know who they're dealing with on the other side. We always wanted to know um, because we would refer a lot of cases to law enforcement, but we also sometimes didn't. Um, there was a great example on the wall we had at Facebook that was uh, mentioned in, in an article where um, it, uh, like an 11-year-old kid had done something really stupid and we were like, what are we going to do with this case? So we wrote a letter to his mother and, it was <laughs> and asked her to have him apologize and he did. And we were like, that's a good resolution for that case. Um, but we, you know, we also, we, we also you know, and it's a weird situation. It goes back to the people in the private sector having a lot of discretion about what to do and, and actually being the only ones who have visibility into what's really happening in a lot of these situations. Um, like that culture of attribution, and this is a, could be a whole other talk too around attribution. Like if I left Facebook in the spring of uh, 2015 and of course in 2016, uh, there was a lot of stuff happening at Facebook around the 2016 presidential election and suggestions of this concept of misinformation. That security team put out um, a really detailed write-up publicly about what had happened from the Facebook perspective and chose to be transparent. I think there were a lot of other platforms that had just as much misinformation on them, but they didn't put out the reports. And so I, I, I think Facebook actually got a lot more heat. Um, so jumping back forward to our case, my team did an amazing job on figuring out who these guys were on the other side. It turns out it was two young men, one 19 and 20, 120. Um, the main person responsible from my team's determination was a kid named Brandon who lived in Florida. Um, and he basically, I don't want to talk about his personal life because I don't know him, but my team got to know him really well and really came to like him as a person. But they also really appreciated his skill as, in terms of obfuscation because it took a lot of effort to track him down. And this would be an amazing talk also. Uh, but um, the thing that the team did that was really great was, you know, when you, when you have a situation where you're trying to get attribution, what we typically do is trigger a lot of back and forth and then sooner or later they make a mistake and expose something. And it could be financial, it can be IP, it could be lots of different things. And so in this case, back in 2016, the way we actually, like we did a lot of back and forth with these guys, because I had said to my team, it's not enough to get 
an NDA signed by someone, uh, we, we don't know their real name. And so my team did the attribution work and the way that they um, exposed themselves w was when we sent the NDA through DocuSign. <laughs> they kind of, it's not so easy to use your VPNs and tours and stuff in those situations. And so an IP leaked to us, we were able to link it to some other stuff that we found on blockchain and pretty soon we knew where um, they were. And then, um, so we knew it was Brandon, who was the main kid behind this. So we, uh, this was an email from a member of my team. Hey Brandon, uh, that was, and, and there were like three or four things in the, e well first off the email was sent to Brandon's actual real email address, which is not what he had been communicating with us. And it said, um, I wish I could see it. Because um, <laughs> it's really good. So anyway, uh, he, in this email, Matt said a few different things, one of which was like, I really want to meet you and talk to you about attribution and, how you, and, and obfuscation and how, how you work this all out. Um, and, he invi and we invited him out to come do a talk to our whole team at Uber in that email. Um, we also said in the email, um, one of our team is uh, in town to interview you and check to make sure you've deleted the data. And because we had figured out where in Florida he lived and we sent uh, uh, a member of our team who was a longtime CIA interrogator. Uh, <laughs> We sent him, and he went and, and met with Brandon, and he put together a very long personality profile and analysis of Brandon and said, basically, this is a 19-year-old kid, 20, maybe he was 20 at the time. This is a 20-year-old kid who, you know, he's afraid. He uh, doesn't leave his house much. He, uh, really likes the, this hacking stuff and computer stuff. He's just gotten involved in it recently. He's trying to figure it all out. And um, so we had uh, a couple of members of my team interact with him. One had a lot of interaction with Brandon and um, we even tried to get him a job at a security company. Um, so I think about this case, like I've given you some facts, thinking about it from the researcher perspective, not mine. You know, there's the version on the left, uh, Uber paid 20 year old hacker who lives with his mom to cover up massive data breach is kind of like one version. And then uh, Nicole Perlroth from, uh, who was a re reporter at the New York Times and an excellent cybersecurity reporter, she did a detailed review and, and published something with Mike Isaac um, who had been the main reporter for the New York Times covering Uber. And they actually somehow got access to a bunch of the emails between Brandon and my team and kind of looked at it from a different perspective and that, but that didn't happen until a few months later. And of course, like the stories that come out the first week are the ones that get read more than the ones that come up a few weeks later. Um, so now I'm gonna um, jump forward to uh, the trial again. And the government presented its case, my team presented its case, I didn't testify, the um, Jury was instructed about a violation of 1030, which is a 18 U.S.C. 1030 is kind of one of the core anti-intrusion laws in federal law in the United States. And one of the, the fundamental thing is, did you access a computer without authorization? And so it went to the jury, and the jury was debating for a few days whether I was guilty or innocent, and they sent out these two notes to the judge. And the jury's allowed to send notes out to the judge. And in this case, the jury asked, could Uber give authorization after the access? Because that's the advice that, the, if you remember, the advice that the lawyer testified he gave was we could, we could authorize it after the fact. I think he used some Latin phrase, nunc pro tunc, during the trial. But the idea was, if somebody trespasses in your yard and then you say, okay, you're welcome here. You know, there was a no trespassing sign, but you're cut, you know, and I didn't personally invite you yet, but you came in and then I can authorize you after the fact. And 
I've never researched the law on that specifically, but that was the advice that I think that bounty companies and a lot of programs have always had. Because if you think about the first time a researcher finds a vulnerability in a company, they probably haven't signed up for the bug bounty program. They probably haven't clicked through any of those terms that be, could be presented as quote unquote authorization. Like that's how the companies try and say that they gave authorization as you publish these policies. Um, the decision at, at the, during the case was the jury just has to go back and read the, the statute, which says an, a, you know, a felony starts at the time of the unauthorized access, or a felony is committed then. So the jury came back with a, a guilty verdict for me, but this isn't what I'm showing you. I'm showing you the, um, a different um, judgment in a criminal case. This is a judgment of United States versus Brandon, the researcher. He um, uh, now also is convicted of a felony as of um, June of this year. So um, there are lots of other different um, situations. I, I don't think I have time to go into them, but these two researchers slash hackers slash felons had um, actually gone and accessed other companies in the same way and found their vulnerabilities and contacted them as well. One of them, um, LinkedIn just called it a breach, called in the FBI. The FBI was not able to find them um, like my team was. Um, we were actually in touch with the team at StubHub because I think uh, the person on the StubHub team used to work for me back when I was at PayPal and they were dealing with a similar situation. They confirmed to us that um, they, they resolve their situation as well. And so from the outside, it looks like they, um, they reached out to a bunch of companies. One company declared a breach. One paid them and tried to explain bug bounty programs to them. Um, and others just kind of did different things. But did the researchers slash hackers slash felons take the data of those other companies and dump it or monetize it? No, they just deleted it actually in those cases too because I think they were trying to help the companies. That's the way I thought about it at the time and that's what, like I'd love to learn more about what actually happened at these other companies. So to kind of wrap it up, I think we uh, really need to look at cases like this from the perspective of the researcher and I feel like it's hurt things a lot from everything I've heard. So we need to get more proactive in communication about the realities and expectations between the public researchers and companies. I remember when this case blew up, my, my dad called me um, that day in 2017 and he's like, nobody understands bug bounty programs. And my dad's like, I think he was like 76 at the time. <laughs> I was like, yeah, dad, I know. <laughs> um, we, um, we need to get better at having like consistent shorter policies um, so that, and we need to make sure, like I still don't know what the right answer for guidance for people is on, a, on that unauthorized access question. So like um, I was talking to somebody and they said I should put a slide into this presentation listing 20 different scenarios and ask whether it's a authorized or unauthorized access. If it's an employee inside the company who accidentally stumbles on an exposed database and then the employee goes into it, is that an unauthorized access that it's now a felony? If it's a uh, pen tester and they go outside the boundaries of the contract and they find something, is that an unauthorized access that needs to be reported? If a bug bounty person does it, like, how, like where, where do you draw these lines? It's not as clear as it should be. Uh, and I haven't seen any, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't get CC'd on notifications to the government about exposure, but um, I do often hear about them and talk to the security leaders beforehand and they don't feel like they have clarity on these issues. Um, I hope that the Department of Justice continues to invest in um, dedicated lawyers who understand cybersecurity and that they get all over the country and that, they, that they're involved in all these cases. You know, there's that one really good thing that DOJ has as a policy that anytime a security researcher is to be prosecuted uh, by one of the districts out in the country, they're supposed to run it by the computer crime section in Washington, D.C. So I think that's a good thing and I'd like to see more stuff like that. Um, 
The thing that uh, bothered my team the most was a lot of people telling them if they'd just done the right thing, like none of this would have happened. That's, not the, that's, that's too simplistic a perspective on, on these complicated dynamics. Um, I want companies to be able to launch these programs. I want researchers, I want someone to someday get that million dollar bounty. And so we need to create an environment where companies are comfortable launching these programs more than ever. And I want to make sure we educate young people on the right ways to do these things. Um, I wish uh, Roots still existed as part of DEF CON because my daughters got to go to that uh, growing up and they learned a lot about this stuff. And we need to have programs like that. Like when we talk about cyber education for kids in schools and stuff like that, it should actually be teaching them about bug bounty programs and how they could go make money while they're in high school. Because then they'd really learn. Because <laughs> they'd be motivated. So anyway, I think um, that's basically um, the stuff that I've been thinking about. We need to really harmonize our program policies. We need to engage people. We need to talk about this stuff. We need to kind of change so that my dad doesn't have to say again, people don't understand. Um, so why am I doing this talk? Why am I taking risks standing up here and talking about this stuff? It's because um, I think this stuff is really important. And I think we should be looking at it from the researcher perspective as well as everybody else. Um, I, since I'm on stage, I want to use this opportunity to pitch uh, my nonprofit work for one second. Uh, I'm the CEO of a nonprofit. I go to Ukraine and help. Uh, I originally tried to volunteer to do cybersecurity work there because I, when I was the CSO of Cloudflare last year, we did a lot of work to help. And so I really enjoyed that. And when I left Cloudflare at the end of last year, I wanted to stay involved. Turns out that our nonprofit, we focus more on medical equipment, and then we started a new program in January um, that I initiated. We get companies to donate their used laptops, and I bring them over. These two pictures on the right were me delivering laptops uh, to kids in, in the Bucha region north of Kyiv that had been devastated in the initial days of the invasion. I was in Ukraine uh, last month, and so these pictures are from there. On the left side was on the 4th of July. We were with some troops who just got back from Bakhmut, and we were doing medical training on um, uh, how to use tourniquets the right way. It's the most important thing they need to know medically. And so we were there, and if you work in a company, go find out what you do with your used laptops and send me a note. Every laptop that I've brought to Ukraine has, become, has come to my organization because of somebody in the security community worked in, to get the people inside their company. To, and I can't tell you how happy you can make a 13-year-old who's doing remote schooling on their parents' phone feel when you show up and give them a MacBook Pro. It was like that, the girl on the bottom right and her mom, we had to wait 20 minutes to take this picture so that they could stop crying. It's like what we take for granted, you know, they're trying to live a normal life in a, in a war zone. Kids can't just like hide in a bunker for years. They need to actually, you know, they had, they, had, they had to go through COVID there too and do remote schooling. And now they're still in remote schooling. Half the kids in the country are in remote schooling and half of those kids don't have a laptop. So um, the other reason I'm doing this is because I told the judge in my case, I wrote a letter to him before my sentencing and I said, if you don't send me to prison, I will stand up and I will talk about the things we need to do better. And I think this is one of those things that we need to do better. So um, I told him I would put my name on the list for every conference and go and talk. And um, the government, the prosecutors were asking that I get 15 months. And the judge said, no, thankfully. So I'm here to give this talk. Um, but I have to live up to my commitment to the judge that I will talk about these things right now. So thank you for your time. Yeah. All right.